I have to tell y'all, I just sat down and did the math. I think I've done this five, over 5,000 times, stood up in front of people. I have never been as nervous as I was just a second ago because there was music playing. I'm telling you, this makes a big difference when you're talking versus when you got to sing. So let me tell you, I just got way out of my comfort zone um, to do that. And I'm grateful for the opportunity and thank you for being here today in worship with us. We are going into the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is six chapters, 155 verses. Some have called it the Grand Canyon of Scripture, that it plunges us to the depths of God's being. Others have said it is the treasure of gold that unlocks and unleashes all that we need in Christ. So this morning, we're going to start that journey. It's going to take us, I believe, about 26 weeks to actually get in it, to digest it, to begin to understand it. But this morning, Father, we thank you that we have a word to sing about. We thank you that we have a word to study. We thank you for Jesus that's living and alive and in us and seeking us out in our lowest moment, with us in our highest moment, and always, always faithful. God, I thank you that we have been equipped with fullness. I thank you that we've been equipped with victory. I thank you that we have been equipped for warfare and that you're there all the time. So God, this morning, as we open this word, Lord, I ask that you would speak to us, your children, your church. God, that you would, from the words that you exchange with us, the knowledge that you give to us, that we would walk out these doors ready and equipped to tell the world that Jesus is the answer. That we would be prepared and equipped to walk in these doors and love one another as family. Lord, I thank you again for Jesus. God, I thank you that he died so that we could have life. And Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us, that guides us to all truth. So Lord, this is a time that you get to speak to us. And I thank you that we have this moment. In Christ's name, amen. So we're in the book of Ephesians. Today we'll be in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. But before we dive into the word... I was looking and researching old news stories. And a few years back, the Los Angeles Times reported of a couple in their 50s who both passed away at the same time. They died of malnutrition living in Los Angeles, California. As they began to search and do research and to go through the apartment where they lived to find out about who they were and how um, in this day and time a couple could die of malnutrition in America, they, but they found something. In different places throughout their apartment, they had over $40,000 in cash. And they died of malnutrition. So here is a couple that is rich and yet starving. I want to tell you about another lady. She lived from 1834 to 1916. Her name was Hetty Green. Hetty Green was known as the uh, First Lady of Finance and the Witch of Wall Street. When she died, she was estimated to be worth $100 million, which is the equivalent today of $2.25 million. Hetty Green got married, had two sons. One of her sons had medical complications. And in the medical complications, because she was looking for the cheapest doctor she could find, her son lost his leg. It had to be amputated. And yet she was totally rich. Hetty Green actually also died of malnutrition. Hetty Green would eat cold oatmeal because it cost too much to crank up the stove to warm the water. This lady, by all standards, even today, past, present, future, any gauge you want to put it against, Hetty Green was wealthy. But she died not understanding how to appropriate her wealth. Well, can I tell you what? In this room today, there are rich people. We are spiritually rich people, and yet we're living, we're malnourished. We're living in such a way that our nutrition is not sufficient. And so when we come to the situations of life, we are not able to be more than conquerors or overcomers because of what Christ has done for us. You see, the Scripture says that you have become enriched when Christ lives in you. 
So what I hope today and the days that follow this is that we dive into the Word and we begin to understand how to appropriate the riches of Christ Jesus, that we begin to learn how to leverage the things that He's done in us and what He has done through us. So I'm going to tell you that Ephesians is a blueprint for believers. Ephesians is a blueprint that tells us this is how you construct the life of faith. This is how you construct a lifestyle that can appropriate the riches of Christ in you. And so let's take our Bibles this morning. Let's turn to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And this is how it begins. Which, by the way, is very common for New Testament letters. There's a pattern here. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you. And peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we look at this passage, as we take these two verses, and we begin to unlock the door to Ephesians, there's some things that immediately, if you will, become clear. That we have an author of the book. Who's the author? Okay, we understand that. But don't just read over that and say, oh, Paul wrote the book. Let me tell you something. You learn a lot about this man just by looking at his name. The first thing you learn is that he is a converted man. It's his conversion. If you took your Bibles and you went back to the book of Acts, chapter 9 and verses 3, 4, 5, and 6, it says that Paul was walking down the road. Saul was walking down the road. This man we know as Paul. He was walking down the road. And when he was walking down the road, the scripture says that a bright light shone, was shined into his eyes. He was blinded. And at that moment of blindedness, the scripture says that Jesus spoke and said, Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? And basically what Paul said was, speak, Lord, I'm ready to hear you. Now, you've got to go back because Saul was a persecutor. He wasn't just your average run-of-the-mill heckler. He was a murderer. He was a negotiator of murder. He was one that encouraged and prodded others to murder. In fact, most historians believe and and can verify that Paul would have been present when Stephen um, was stoned and they were throwing at him. He wasn't throwing the rocks, but he was over there going, make it happen. He would have been like the... Hebrew mafia, hiring the hit men, unavailable. So we began to learn about this man. His name used to be Saul. We know from Scripture that he was a Hebrew among Hebrews, that he was a religious leader. He was um, in line to become the head of Judaism. And he was proud of who he was. But then this day, Saul is living life. This day, he's intersected by the Lord Jesus. This day, whatever he had been, he was no longer. And the scripture says that the man Saul became the man Paul. But don't stop there because it's not just the fact that he was converted from um, death to life. He was converted in behavior. It says he was Paul, an apostle. This is an interesting side note. It has no real value except that it make you go, hmm. He was named after King Saul, the Hebrew king. The scripture says that King Saul stood head and shoulders above the rest. In fact, some renderings of the name Saul actually means tall one. So he was named Saul, tall one. Let me tell you what the name Paul renders as. Tiny, little, small. So he went from the tallest to the smallest. And I want to tell you, when you will lower yourself and make, die to yourself and make yourself available to God, he will take what you have and you will stand taller than when you're tall. Sean, that's hope for you. Yes. Yes, it is. You can stand tall when you humble yourself in the Lord Jesus Christ. Saul became Paul. It's a story 
an, a, an account of his conversion. But you see, when we begin to read, not only in that first verse, Paul, we know that he was a converted man. We also see, as I said earlier, an apostle. That means he has a call on his life. Now, you've got to understand what the word apostle meant in New Testament days and what it means today. When you look and say, Paul, an apostle, there are certain criteria that this man had to meet. He had to be an eyewitness of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you can look and say, wait a minute. Jesus had already ascended into heaven before Paul came on the scene as a follower of Christ. So how did he get to look him in the eye? Because it says that on the road to Damascus, when the bright light was shining, that Jesus chose to manifest himself, to physically show himself as the risen Lord to Paul. So Paul became an eyewitness, therefore qualified to be ranked as and known as an apostle. But I want to tell you something. Not all, not all eyewitnesses became apostles, but all apostles were eyewitnesses. So you see, Paul not only had an encounter with the Lord Jesus, but at that moment when he was asked a question, why do you persecute me? And basically, God, what do I need to do? Paul surrendered himself to Christ. Many of you will have an encounter on the road with God in your life's journey. And many of you will be able to say, I have seen the Lord, not physically, but spiritually speaking. I have seen the Lord. The Lord has made himself known to me. And you're going to have to make a choice because just because God is revealed, it does not mean that the deal is sealed. Paul only became a follower of Christ when he chose through repentance to give himself over from who he used to be and what he believed. He gave himself over to what God had said he wanted him to be. This morning, you have to make a choice. And you have to think back, God, have I made a promise to you? God, have I done this? And Lord, today I want to repent of sin. I want to turn to you. I no longer want to follow what I was educated to do, what I was conditioned to do, what culture said I ought to do. But today, God, I want to become identified with you as your follower. You see, because Paul was conditioned to hate. Paul was conditioned to persecute. Paul was conditioned to walk around in academic arrogance. And at the moment that he approached Christ, and that Christ approached him, and the moment he surrendered, Paul said, I'm going to lay it down. I'm going to give up being the tallest, and I will become the smallest. That in my weakness, he will be known. In my weakness, I will be strong. There's a passage that said, how long will you strive against the goads? I have no idea what a goad is, but I know you don't want to strive against one because the Bible tells me so, all right? And I want to tell you that in this room today, there are people living on the bad side of victory <laughs> in defeat because we are holding on to my way. We're holding on to what we think. Instead of asking God, what do you want? Paul, it shows us that he was a converted man. Paul, it shows us that he was a called man. Now, let's go back to this idea of apostle in that day and time. It was an eyewitness who surrendered to what was known as the way because they had not yet been called Christians and that they were followers who were specially poured into by Christ. So in other words, we're not going to have any more apostles as Paul was. If somebody stands up and um, identifies themselves in the same vein as Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, those guys, you look at them and say, nope, that office died at the last eyewitness death. That's not an office today. These people were appointed for a certain period of time in history by God in his divine providence to be the ones that wrote for us the words of the New Testament. Speaking of Paul, he wrote over half of the New Testament. And God is using it today. Now, so if that's what an apostle was then, an eyewitness account who surrendered himself to the way, and we hear the word apostle used today, then what is that person? Well, if you take the word apostle, it actually translates sent one. 
And in Scripture, Jesus said, As the Father has sent me, as the Father has apostled me, so I apostle you. Don't overinflate the title. Embrace the title. You are an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, not in the sense of an eyewitness who is appointed to record Scripture so others may know for generations to come for all of eternity. But you are an apostle who is to stand up and say, in my own way, I had a Damascus Road experience. In my own time, Jesus approached me. In my own time, he offered to me salvation. And recognizing his gift and his call and his urging and recognizing what he has done on the cross for me, I have surrendered my life to him and he is now my Lord and Savior. And what he's done for me, he will do for you. So Paul has a conversion. Paul has a call on his life that is separate from ours, but Paul has a call on his life that is the same as ours. He is sent by God to carry out the good news to humanity. And you say, well, how did this man, how did this man who absolutely abandoned his, his faith of origin, how he was brought up, his education to become the head religious guy in all of the land who had so much hated Christians that not only did he kill them, but he had them killed. How did this man all of a sudden become so confident that he could walk into the room in front of the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, and all of the people of that day and stand in front of the Roman government? I want you to see his confidence because it says, Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus, how? By the will of God. You see, when you as a person understand that there is a moment that you can be converted, that there is a call on your life to be a voice for the Lord Jesus, and you understand that it is by the will of God, all of a sudden, weakness passes away and meekness takes over. Now, what's the difference between meek and weak? Weak is you're just weak. Meek is strength under control. It is power with a purpose. And you don't walk in the room and say, hey, look at me, watch what I've done. But you walk in the room and you say, what did Paul say? If anybody could boast, I was this, I was that, I was some of that over there. And anything else you can think of, I was it. And then I met Christ. And when I met Christ, he changed me. And all that zeal and all of that fervor that he had for religion was changed and transformed into a passion for the Lord Jesus and Him crucified. And that's where we need to understand. Confidence comes not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of God Himself. And I want to tell you something. Paul knew the will of God for his life. Paul had a dramatic experience, somewhat like we probably will never know. But I want to tell you it's no less miraculous. When Jesus entered your life, and he saved a wretch like you and me. It was a miracle. Paul knew the will of God. And you today can know the will of God. God's will can be known. You say, well, how do I go about finding it? Because I want to tell you, many times throughout the year, we have conversations with people. Pastor, I want to know God's will for my life. How can I know what God wants me to do? How can I know where to turn? Should I take two steps and turn right or should I take two, three steps and turn left? And Satan is a master. He's a master at paralysis. He will paralyze the believer because we don't have the confidence to step out by faith. Faith is the essence of things not seen, right? What, we don't know it, but we know who we're trusting in. And when Paul had that encounter on the Damascus Road, he did not know what God was going to do with him. I don't think he knew that God was going to send him into training for three years. I don't think he would have known that God was going to cause him to be snake bit, beaten, um, shipwrecked, imprisoned, and maybe other things that I've left off, but those are what popped in my mind. But before he knew the details of the assignment, he reported to duty. 
So when you, we, us, Mount Zion Baptist Church, when we are looking for what is the will of God in my life, where do you begin? You begin with the known will of God. You see, there are certain things that you don't have to pray about. God, is this your will? Because it is clearly declared and defined in Scripture that this is the will of God. Let me give you some examples. You can jot these down and read them later. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Which, by the way, if you will keep these outlines and take notes, you will have a literal um, commentary on the book of Ephesians in your own handwriting when we're done. So I want to encourage you. Bring a Bible. Take notes. Get involved. Be an active listener. Because God is actively speaking But for it to be a total exchange, we've got to actively listen. But this is what he says in 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. Talking about the known will of God. It says, God, speaking of God, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So this morning, if you're battling with God, what is your will for my life? You can put a check mark by this. It is God's will that you surrender your heart in um, repentance to the Lord Jesus Christ and the work that he did on the cross at Calvary. You can know that. And if you are battling in your mind today, should I be born again or should I not be born again? Well, you can know that's not from God because God has already declared that all men should be saved. If you're looking across the aisle over there and you see um, Karen Angel and you think, you know, I'd go share the will, I would go share the gospel with her, but I'm not sure that God would want her to be saved. Well, that's the scripture says you can take that out of your mind because it is the will of God for all of humanity to be born again. So when we take the gospel, when we walk out these doors, we are to take the gospel to anybody, everybody, wherever they are. That's the will of God. We can know that. We can know some other things. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God. Okay, so we want to know what the will of God is. He said, here it is very clearly. Your sanctification. That means for you to be set apart. That means for you to be different from an unbelieving world. He says, I want you to be different from them. I want you to be set apart from them. And then he says something very pointed, very conviction, convicting. That you abstain from sexual immorality. So I want to tell you, whether it's me, whether it's you, whether it's anybody that you come into contact with. When they say, oh, I believe this is the will of God. They have believed a lie, embraced an untruth, and they have stepped out of what God says is. And be very careful. Because it's not just what you do. The scripture says it's what you think in your heart. So we can know that is the will of God. And when we look at it, we don't have to ask. He wants us to be set apart, and He wants us to be sexually pure. All right, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, it says, In everything give thanks. That's the will of God. So if you're walking around going, I'm not going to thank God for this, or I'm not thankful for that. No, it says in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. Um, In Christ for you. Now you could go back and I will tell you this. It's a simple Google search. um, About just Google search scriptures that confirm the will of God. You'll find anywhere from 10 to 50 I think is what I found when I searched it out. But all of them will reveal to you God's known will. So you can do that. So God's will can be known. God's will is revealed in obedience. The next thing you have to do is you surrender yourself to the Lord. You say, Lord, here I am. I'm willing to do whatever your will is. Now, before you gloss over that and in your mind say yes, you better think about really what that means. Because whatever means, like for Paul, it meant all of those things that I just listed a moment ago. Look at John, right down off to the side, John 7, 17. This is what Jesus said. 
if any man is willing to do his will, now that's God's will, he shall know of the doctrine whether it be of God. So you see that you see a, a, a progression there? The knowing follows the willing. The knowledge comes after the surrender. Have you ever, you don't have to publicly identify this, but I'll just go ahead and tell you I, I am one of these. Lord, I'll do whatever it is you want me to do if you'll just show me before I have to walk out the door. And God, I'll follow you to the ends of the world if it's comfortable. God, I will do whatever you want as long as you keep some money in my pocket. God, I am ready to trust you, but how about give me a heads up before it gets uncomfortable? You see, I think that's very common, by the way, and I think it's a big lie from the devil. There's a kid's song. This is nursery, nursery rhyme season, all right? The devil is a liar, and I don't trust him. His power over me is none. The devil is a liar, and I don't trust him. His power over me is none. The devil is a liar, and I don't trust him. His power over me is none. His power over me is none. That is nursery rhyme, preschool age, but deep, deep truth. And he will lie to you and say, well, God just really doesn't want to reveal his will to you because you're not one of his special ones. And he has revealed it to other people. But I want to tell you, knowledge follows surrender. If you want to know the will of God for your life, your answer has to be, yes, sir, here I am, ready to go. And then, as you live out the known will of God. I used to say, if you don't know what to do, do what you know. And then it became apparent that some people didn't know stuff but nastiness and they'd run back to nasty. So if you don't know what to do, do what God would tell you to do. And you find that in His Word. And He will reveal things to you. Sometimes it's very specific, sometimes it's general. But when you follow the general will of God, He will give you the specific will for your life. Is it immediate? No. Um, sometimes it takes perseverance. Sometimes it takes for what seems like forever. But an on-time God is very faithful. So God's will is revealed to us in obedience. So, here we go. We got this author. His name is Paul. We can see that he was converted. We can see that he had a call. And we can see that he had confidence in the call because he knew that it came from the will of God. And he was willing to follow it wherever it took him. Now, so what is the next thing that we see? Let's keep reading. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints. So we see the recipients, right? We know who he's writing to. He's writing to the church. And he calls them saints. Go ahead and look at me. Let's say it together. I'm a saint. Oh, isn't that hard to say? Because you know who you are. But the scripture says that through the blood of Christ, that you are a saint. He's talking about a position. Here you sit in Mount Zion Baptist Church. You start looking around. You ask yourself, who are the saints? Well, we just said it. If you're a born-again believer, you are a saint. We have all kind of ideas about what a saint is or what a saint looks like. If you come from Catholicism, the way you became a saint was you had to live a chaste life and have a documented miracle. And so there are saints that you will find if you start studying religion, religious history and you'll understand how these people became a saint. But what I want to tell you is this, that in the body of Christ, in the New Testament, that through the blood of Christ, shed on the cross at Calvary, when you surrender yourself to Jesus and say, be my Savior, you are a saint. So look at the person. Now, you already said you're a saint. Look at the person next to you and say, you're a saint too. Oh, yeah. Huh. Yeah. So what do we know from this? How, what, could, what do we glean from it? First of all, this is a new identity. 
This is something that is not natural. Because in our natural selves, we are not saintly. You agree? Yes, in our, we are vicious, we are covetous, we are jealous, we are a lot of things. And so this is a new identity. Paul's talking to these people and says, this is what you were, but let me tell you what you are today. He says, today it's an identity. Ephesians 5, 3 says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Now, this is not the only things, but he's giving us an understanding. He says, as this person in Christ, new creature, old things passed away, all things made new. He says, as this person, he says, I want you to examine yourself. I want you to submit yourself to me. I want you to lay it out there. And he says, I want you to have a behavior that is worthy of your position. That's child of God. One of the things we were at um, Clayton State, we were talking about judgment out of Romans 2. And one of the things that came out of that conversation about why people don't go to church, people that are not currently in church, why they don't go to church, and one of the things that came out of the conversation was this, because of the people that are at the church. And then they begin to interact with those people and they say, well, why would I go to church? Because they're no different from me. That doesn't mean you have to be perfect, hear me. But what it does mean is when you're wrong, you say, I'm sorry. When you make a mistake, you say, I blew it. When you are struggling with something, we're real. And say, here it is. I don't understand it. But let's sit down together and um, walk through it. That's why you got to have the word. So he says, you have this new identity. It is who you are. And Ephesians 5 says, let your practice equal your position. A saint is a set-apart one. But notice this, he's not talking to them just about a new identity, but he says to them, to the saints in Ephesus. As a saint, you have a new identity. As a saint, you have a geographical position. Wherever you are, you are to be a saint. One who lets your behavior match your position. So, you're sitting in church. You're like, I'm a saint. I'm sitting in church. Well, if you go to the club on Friday night, guess what? You can't check your sainthood at the door. You got to take it in there with you because it's yours. It's stuck on you like Band-Aid. Mm-hmm. You don't get rid of it. It's there. When you're watching TV, guess what? You're still a saint. When you're going down the road and the guy cuts you off or the lady cuts you off at the intersection, your your behavior still needs to match your position. Now, mama story. Mama calls some people heavenly sandpaper. And she said... Chris, God put those people in your life to smooth off your rough edges. So you need to thank God for them. I was like, Mama, I don't like them. She said, but trust God. And so they're rubbing off the the things in you that are not conforming to the image of Christ. When we are out and about, we have this new identity. It's a saint. Wherever we are, and let me tell you, there are saints in millions of places right now. Today, you're to be a saint in this room. When you exit this room, as you go, you're to be a saint. So Paul is saying to this, I want you to know that you have an identity. And wherever you are, that is how you're supposed and where you're supposed to live it out. But you see, it's not just an identity and a geographical location It is a spiritual position to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ. He says, you're a saint because you're in Christ. Now, you say, why did you make a big deal about geographical location? Because I told you a moment ago, there are millions of saints located all over the world. And they are saints and they are followers of God. 
And so you can be a saint in a lot of places. But all of humanity is in only one of two positions right now. You are, the scripture says that you're either in Adam, and that means that you are eternally separated, you're a stranger, you're an enemy, you're an alien to God. You are not in fellowship, you're not in relationship with God. Or you're in Christ. And if you are in Christ, you have been purchased by the blood of Jesus at the cross. You have submitted yourself to his control, his lordship. You, have been, you are willing to repent when you are confronted by sin and you follow him. So in Adam, you can be a lot of places too. But spiritually speaking, right now, you're in one of two spots. You're in Adam. If you're in Adam, you are eternally separated from God. That's just the facts. That's the truth. There's no need to embellish it or sermonize it. If you're in Christ, you are in Christ for all of eternity. First Corinthians fifteen twenty two says this. In Adam all die. In Christ all are made alive. If you have not surrendered your heart to Christ, you are in Adam. But I'll tell you what Ephesians two one says. You have been made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. So if you are here today and you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, the Scripture says that you are dead in trespasses and sin. That means that you're eternally separated from God. But when you are in Christ, you are reconciled to God. You're no longer an enemy, but you're a friend. You have received the inheritance of of all that God has to offer you, and it is yours for all of eternity. So we have the author, we have the recipients, and then we also have the greeting. Go to verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now those are two words, grace and peace, and it always follows that order, by the way. It's always grace and then peace. You don't get peace ahead of grace. And help you understand that. Help me, let's talk through that just a moment. Grace is unmerited favor. It is getting from God what I do not deserve. I do not deserve His mercy. I do not deserve Jesus dying on the cross. I do not deserve to be reconciled because of my sin. And my sin is an affront to His holiness. And so, when At the cross, when I receive grace, it is followed by peace. Peace of mind, peace of life, peace with God. Hebrews 4.16 says this, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Paul walked in a real world. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, but he was a cosmopolitan man, so he could walk also in the Greek world. And Paul took two very popular greetings from both of those worlds. He sanctified them. He baptized them, if you will. And he used them to help us understand what Christ was doing for us. So if you were walking down the streets of the city, and you were in a Greek culture, you would look at them and you would say charis, which means grace. If you were walking in and among Hebrew people, you would say shalom, peace. And Paul sanctified those words. He sanctified grace and peace and said, it's through unmerited favor that you can have peace with God. But you will never have peace, and I'm going to repeat this because it's very important. You will never have peace until you have experienced grace. Now, there's this other word. It's peace. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, that means the recipient of grace, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How do you get peace with God? Only through our Lord Jesus Christ. How do you gain access to 
the Lord Jesus Christ through the grace of God that gave you unmerited favor and handed to you something you did not deserve. All right? So when you see that, Paul is talking to these people. He's giving them a greeting. But at the same time, if you will, he's teaching them a Sunday school lesson. Peace is the end of estrangement. Philippians 4, 7 says, The peace of God which passes all understanding, and misunderstanding, by the way, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ. I don't know what you're going through, but I will know this, that whatever it is right now, you can claim the peace of God in your life. You say, well, how do I appropriate that? You remember Peter? They were in the storm, and the storm was blowing, and he saw Jesus walking across on the water, And he said, hey, Lord, I'd like to do that. That's pretty cool. He jumped out of the boat. And what? As long as his eyes were on Jesus, what was happening? He was walking on the water. When he took his eyes off of Jesus and put his eyes on the storm, what happened? He sank. Don't be too hard on Peter. He was the only one of 12 that got out of the boat. All right? Don't forget that. But his eyes were on Jesus, and he walked on the water. You're going to face storms. In fact, later on in chapter 6 of this book of Ephesians, we're going to find out that storms will come your way. Challenges will come your way. But the peace of God passes all understanding. It keeps your heart and mind through Christ. 2 Corinthians 12 says this, My grace is sufficient for you. That means His grace is sufficient no matter what you face. So you write at this moment, You think about the worst thing that can happen in your life. I don't know what your thing is, but you think about it. The thing that has been a fear moment for you, the thing that has paralyzed you, the thing that has kept you from doing what you believe God was calling you to do, or even just stepping out and trying to live a dream. His grace is sufficient for you. Death, His grace is sufficient. Failure, His grace is sufficient. Somebody else stepping against you and hurting you and being unjust to you, His grace is sufficient. It will keep you. It will guard your heart. It will guard your mind. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father. So this Christian life, This grace and peace. The commencement of it, it is by grace. The continuance of your Christian life shall keep your heart and mind through Christ. The conclusion of it is, my grace is sufficient and how do you have it? It's through Christ. Please hear me. Let's take off the religious mask for just a moment. Okay. And all the lies that we've believed and been taught to believe and they become so ingrained in us that we don't even realize that we've believed the lie. That if I work hard enough, I'll be okay. That if I don't do so many bad things, I'll be okay. That if I perform well, I'm going to be okay. That if I just power of positive thinking I will be okay if I give enough to other people if I give enough to the church I'm going to be okay if I'm generous and benevolent if I'm a good neighbor it's going to be okay this week my neighbor had a pile of limbs I never see my neighbor out she had a pile of limbs and we were rolling our trash cans down to the um, side of the road so the trash people could come by and pick it up. And she hollered over and she said, Hey, um, I called the trash people about this stack of limbs and um, they told me they don't pick those up. Do you know anybody that could get my stack of limbs? I was thinking, la, 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 I don't know nobody. You know, you know what I'm talking about. And then Russell and I actually went and got the stack of limbs. And I remember as we were driving off, I had this thought, Lord, I bet you'd like that. 
I serve somebody. You know, it was what you kind of do. And then I thought, you know what? Probably not. I mean, he wasn't that he was displeased with it, but it didn't gain me special favor with God because I picked up a limb. No matter, I could go pick up all the limbs in all of South Metro Atlanta, and it's not going to make God more happy with us. What makes God happy with us is that when we come to him with repentant hearts, recognizing that we are offensive to him, that our sin separates us from him, and when we come to him and say, Jesus, your grace is sufficient. It is all I need and it is the only thing that will reconcile us. That's what pleases God. And it's become about the trophies, the recognitions, the accolades, the shout outs, the likes, the retweets, the number of friends that like us on social media and all of that. And here's the truth. That will be burned up on the day of judgment. What is not consumed on the day of judgment is what Christ did on the cross and the transforming work that he does in your heart. It's going to take an extra measure of faith. It's going to take an extra measure of grace to understand how to navigate the world we live in right now. But when we as a church, as the body of Christ, specifically the people of Mount Zion, we surrender ourselves to God, he says, my grace is sufficient. And he will give us victory in him. But here's the funny thing about victory in Jesus. Sometimes it's masked as a trial, a struggle, a challenge, a conflict. But he's perfect. So I have to ask you today. You know I do. Because we do every time. Have you? In your search for peace. Internally, externally. Have you surrendered your life, your heart, your mind. To the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you come to him and said. That Jesus, I recognize that my sin separates us. I know that. And I know the only antidote to sin is blood. And I know the only blood that was worthy is the blood of Christ. And so Jesus, today I receive what you have to offer. And if you have not come to Christ as your Savior, do not. I beg you, do not leave today without that being settled you say I got that one check mark but pastor where's the peace it says that um, the scripture says that we have peace with God and we have the peace of God peace with God is salvation the peace of God is daily surrender daily submission daily obedience And you simply may have to do this. God, I know the blood has covered me, but I know that my mind has taken over and I have become my own boss. God, I want to get back in step with you. And right now, the answer is yes. Yes. No qualifiers. Yes. I will follow. Paul is giving us, and over the weeks will reveal to us, the blueprint to build a solid house of faith. Can I encourage you not to miss? Can I encourage you to be here active with your Bible open, a pen in your hand, writing down? May, God may reveal something I never said, but that's the cool thing about the Spirit of God. He will speak. So, Father, this morning, as we are in the midst of this Word, as we are surrendered to you or have the opportunity to surrender to you god i pray that our answer will be yes 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 amen and yes lord cement in us that there's 
the key to peace is walking through the door of grace. I invite you this morning, if, if, as you have had an encounter with God through His Holy Spirit, I invite you this morning to come for salvation if you don't have that certainty, that security. I invite you this morning to come here to the, to the steps, to kneel down and say, God, here's my life. Take it. Use it. Empty me out. And fill me up with you, God. I invite you to come this morning and for salvation. I invite you to come this morning to publicly, publicly declare your faith in Christ. To follow the Lord in baptism. To identify to all of the world that you are a follower of Christ. I invite you this morning to come and join, be a member, a part of the family of Mount Zion Baptist Church. Lord, have your way in us. We ask it. Let's stand. Let's sing. You come. Respond.